three, two, one. Never has there been a better time to be alive in human history. If you're not feeling it, you must discover why. Join Matthew Bolton in developing and applying a framework of objective optimism toward a flourishing life of meaning, health, and happiness. Here's your host, Matthew Bolton. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Mr. Brightside. I'm Matthew Bolton. Today's show is an interview with guest Nita Patel. Now, I invited Nita on because I was quite taken with her approach to modern etiquette, which she distinguishes from traditional etiquette, uh, which she sees as more following societal conventions. Modern etiquette is more about your outer actions and your inner awareness uh, coming together to which achieve your best self. And I, I just love the sound of that. And I wanted to know more about it. And I really did have a lot of fun with her exploring these ideas. She gave us uh, lots of examples of, uh, you know, examples of, of different aspects of etiquette um, that people maybe are just not aware of or seem to have lost. And it's really about that awareness um, that she thought, you know, people just need to be made aware of some of these things. It, it's it's uh, good for them. Uh, good for you if you are aware of these. And I thought that immediately, and that's why I wanted to invite her on and, uh, you know, check myself and see what do I need to be aware of more in terms of etiquette and how I'm bringing myself to my own life and to, uh, you know, social situations. Um, We talked about uh, her book, Boss Vibes, um, Self-Esteem, Success, and the Art of Etiquette is her book. And, uh, you know, we got a taste of what it's all about. And then it's after having this interview, I certainly want to read the book and I'm sure you will too. I don't want to go in and try to tell you all about what we talked about. Uh, I just wanted to give you a taste. You can go in and find it for yourself. Uh, it's a really great interview. Uh, go on and enjoy. Hi, everybody. Welcome now to our interview. I'm joined by Nita Patel. Nita is a speaker, author, and artist who believes in modern etiquette as a path to becoming our best selves. Born in Croydon, UK, as a child, Nita would travel frequently between London and Dallas, attending primary school in both places. She was influenced by American and English culture and her parents' deep Indian origin. In her formative years, being an amalgam of values and mores, Nita would attempt to mold her persona to fit her circumstance, such as disguising her English accent as a teenager in America to avoid the inevitability of teenage harassment. These types of experiences and coping strategies helped to formulate her strong and resilient character. Through her, uh, through her professional years and prior to her immersion in creative arts, Ms. Patel has over two decades of demonstrated technology leadership experience in various industries with a concentrated focus in healthcare for 14 of those 20 plus years. Her investment in psychology theory and practice is what led her to a deep interest in helping others. As a catalyst, finding additional ways to express her creativity led her to pursue her calling professionally as an artist for the past eight years. She has become deeply and passionately devoted to nurturing others and in building their confidence and brand through speaking and consultative practices. Sounds excellent, Nita. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. All right. So um, I recognize myself that uh, etiquette is lacking big time and it, uh, it alarms me. It shocks me sometimes. Um, but of course, I haven't uh, taken it anywhere in, in the way of a subject of deep study as you have. And this show here is about uh, exploring novel approaches to crucial aspects of life. Hence, you're here. Um, I'm very interested to learn about your unique approach to etiquette and your perspective on it as central not only to a good society, but in living a thriving personal life of self-esteem, which is also what this show is very much about. So um, I wonder if you could uh, start perhaps first with a brief history more than uh, this little bio I gave. What led you to think of etiquette as a central issue and why is it important to you? Um, you know, as you mentioned, mentioned in the bio, I did grow up in two different cities. I grew up and I went to school in my younger years when I was in London as well as in Dallas. And so if you can imagine kind of the day and night in terms of culture and discipline, and that was one of the biggest determining factors because I went to a couple years of school in Dallas here where I'm at now. And then I would go to maybe a year of school in London and back and forth. And uh, because my parents you know, we're traveling um, for family and business reasons, but, um, you know, the disciplining and how you conduct yourself, how you act in school, (laughs) um, they were just all very different, you know, over there uh, in London, you know, sitting up straight, sitting right, um, being a girl, how you're supposed to sit (laughs) um, was very precise. And if you weren't sitting, you know, in a very specific way, it was untolerated. 
um, versus the culture, you know, in Dallas, when I would come back to school, I mean, it was just so, so relaxed. And um, I think going back and forth a few times throughout that period in my childhood just gave me a huge perspective. And I felt that some of the more disciplined ways were really right. And I think I didn't really understand more of that until I went into my corporate career and I was managing people. I was interviewing lots and lots of people, you know, um, hiring lots of people. And I saw how people showed up. I saw how people would bring themselves to an interview or, you know, come ask for a promotion. And um, it was, there was a gap. <laughs> I, I felt the need to share, you know, um, this is how you show up. Here's how, you know, you create an elevated perspective and elevated brand about yourself, whether it's personal or professional, you know. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Um, now I've heard you define modern, modern etiquette as where your outer actions and your inner awareness come together to achieve your best self. I love the sound <laughs> of it. Uh, can you break it down for us though? What do you mean by that? Yeah. So, you know, I, let me tell you, I think let's go back to traditional etiquette. Traditional okay. etiquette was really, when, when people hear the term etiquette, they think about how your silverware is placed at a formal event, right? right. <laughs> it's like, I don't know which fork to use. I don't know where the glass goes. Um, and so people think that that's etiquette, but really modern, and, and that was traditional etiquette. You know, there was a lot about uh, your external circumstances and making sure that you are mindful, um, but also how others were perceiving you. Modern etiquette, is really about doing things, having the awareness, but doing things in a way that it impacts you personally. And yeah, there's definitely that external component. Um, but I can give you an example. Yeah. You know, um, people have a power suit, right? <laughs> when they're going on an interview or they have a big meeting or something, you know, you put on your power suit, right? Okay. And um, why? It's because it makes you feel good, right? You feel, you, you know, stand two inches taller, you feel more confident. Um, and so it, with modern etiquette, the point that I want to help people understand is it's not that you're getting dressed for someone else, but you're feeling better about yourself. And to your point, it, it, it boosts your self-esteem, you know? So when you do all those little things throughout the day, um, another example that I like to give is in our digital age, we are kind of lost in our cell phones and, yes. you know, we're heads down. Um, and so, you know, we're on our phones and we open the door and we don't pay attention to anyone who's behind us or, and so when you step out of that, you know, you have awareness that somebody's behind you and, you know, you hold the door open for them. It's just all those little things that elevate your confidence, it elevates your self-esteem. And um, at the end of the day, you know, you develop respect for yourself and other people respect you. Um, but I think that that's, a, that's kind of the pivotal point for making better decisions, you know, finding success. When you're feeling confident, when your self-esteem is high, um, you can pretty much do anything. <laughs> Right. Uh, that's a lot of this. What, what I was really uh, interested in about your, about your approach, as I said before, is that um, it's really about it's not so much just how you treat other people, but it's about how you treat yourself. Absolutely. And and, uh, and it's about, you know, it's, it's for you in a way. Now, of course, it is about other people as well, but but it's really sure. about you. Um, I was fascinated one time I heard you on another show. You were talking about even dressing up at home and dining at home. Uh, what, what did you what were you saying about that? Uh, um, call like just. Even enjoying, even like, you know, um, what should I, should I say, following decorum at home and just being a little dressed up at your own house it makes you feel better. It's not about other people, certainly in this case. So Right, right. I mean, and, you know, I think the term that I use in my book is um, something about it's your second skin, you know, modern manners, etiquette is your second skin. It's not something that you come home and you take off. And that's why, because even if you're alone or even if it's, you know, just two people, I, I don't think that that matters. I think what matters is you set your, you know, you set your plate, you use your glass, your chinaware, your um, silverware, use it every day, you know, use it three times a week. Um, 
all of that just makes you feel better. It improves your dining experience. It, um, you know, you turn some music on versus sitting on the couch, eating on a paper plate in front of the TV. (laughs) That is a completely different experience. And it's also making you feel, um, you know, unmotivated. Maybe that's a good word to describe it, right? You're just very relaxed. You're very, um, but you're not really feeling motivated. And I think that the difference is, and I'll take it a step further. Yeah, please. Uh, when you are expanding on having that fine dining experience, regardless of, you know, whether you cooked at home or whether you picked up food on the way home, um, but just the presentation and how you um, lay it out and how you eat it, it's actually soothing to your di- digestive system. So, you know, you are then going to be able to have a different, um, the food is, you know, they say food is medicine. So this is actually medicinal because you're having nice calm dinner. You're listening to music. Um, and, uh, so your body's going to process that differently versus your slouch or, or you're listening to, you know, you're having maybe frustrating conversations or um, anything like that, you know, that's also impacting your digestive system negatively while you're eating. So there's so many deeper level meanings behind why you want to set a plate and, you know, sit at the table and enjoy your meal. Um, Yeah, I, I could go on in so many different tangents there. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I mean, it's fine to go on some of them and maybe we will as we go along. We might we might hit on a couple that, that bring you back to some of those tangents. Um, sure, sure. With this idea of, of uh, manners, elevating our self-esteem um, and, and, and other things that you're bringing up, is this something akin to like manners maketh man from Kingsman? Is that, is that even, is that something related to that at all? Uh, you know, what did you say? Not, not so much. Not so much. (laughs) Not so much. I mean, I probably share a few things in the book that talk about, you know, that's related to that. But Mm -hmm. um, I would say for the most part, it's really focused on your well-being, your self-esteem, your personal, you know, health. And, um, and like I said, um, there is that small external component. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to FaceTime nowadays. (laughs) <laughs> what do you mean so, everybody, everybody uh, wants to FaceTime? Well, we have the option. So instead of, you know, calling, people are now FaceTiming, mm-hmm. um, video calling. Yeah. And um, so when you don't have the awareness that you shouldn't do it in public at a restaurant, you know, where somebody's sitting two feet close to you and, you know, you start FaceTiming, <laughs> that I would say is when you don't do something for the sake of, others, right? So um, while it's still a respect component because you are respecting yourself and, you know, people are getting upset and frustrated with you if you're doing that. Um, But that's an example of how externally, how modern manners and etiquette impacts your environment. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm sure you've seen it happen. (laughs) I've seen it happen all over the place. And I do want to say, I wasn't trying to discount it by saying, by, you know, referring to a popular film, but I, I, I meant that I meant more like in terms of, in terms of your health, your self-esteem, this is building you, your manners. Yes, yes. That's what I meant more. Okay, that. okay. That's, what it said. That's how it spoke to me. But um, yeah. And in what ways, I guess you've already said uh, a few examples of what people might do. And, and you hinted at a couple examples of what are not good, uh, you know, actions. Um, in what ways have we lost degrees or even complete rules of etiquette, would you say? Um, I think, as I mentioned earlier, you know, being in our digital age, I think that we have just lost our sense of awareness. Mm -hmm. And so what once might have seemed like common sense is no longer as common. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Um, Yeah. I mean, like I said, you know, people don't know what's around them. People don't know who's around them because they're so engrossed in their, um, their digital devices. And so they're just acting kind of, or maybe living in their head is a better way to say it. Living in their head. That's a good one. Okay. Yeah. I see. Um, do you, do you have a theory as to why we've, we've con, you know, we've common sense is now a different, it means something else. Um, you know, it's enough that you've recognized that like this loss and you have a prescription, but I just wonder if you have any guesses as to how we got here. You know, I think our society has just gotten very relaxed over time. Mm -hmm. And um, I think as the digital age 
expanded. Um, we became more and more relaxed. And so it's the same reason that, you know, you probably see five people sitting at a table eating, but everybody's has their phone up, you know, the same reason is um, they're just no longer paying attention to what's present, what's in front of them. And so it's impacting everything, you know, it's not, it's impacting relationships, for example, mm-hmm. um, when you're at dinner and, you know, you have your phone in front of you the whole time or everyone does, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you continue building a relationship with anyone, whether it's your friends, family, um, and, and then that carries on into your professional life. And so that becomes a little bit disrespectful, right? You lose your client or you lose, um, you're not actively listening anymore. Uh, so there's just so many impacts to that. All right. But yeah, I think that the digital age is really where we've kind of become relaxed and yes. we're kind of losing that. Yes, digital age. That's a good, I mean, it makes a lot of sense anyway. So um, I, I now I recognize here, I'm going to ask you about uh, teenagers in a sec. And I, I recognize that we're talking about everyone. I've mentioned already that it's, it's my wife and I both, we frequently shocked by uh, the lack of common, common sense, common manners and people of our own age and even older. So mm-hmm. I'm not just picking on the teens, but uh, what are teens in particular missing in terms of etiquette, do you think? Excuse me. Um, you know, I think when we talk about etiquette, I would say it's a few different aspects. I mean, like I said, they certainly don't know that they, you know, need to put their phone down at the dinner table. Um, It's become acceptable because you see children younger and younger who are occupied with iPads, (laughs) you know, and they're watching their little cartoons on um, YouTube and what have you. So um, I think it starts at a much younger age now. And so that realization is not there which then they're not able to connect. And so when a teen has to have a conversation with an adult, they can't make eye contact. They don't know um, how to shake a hand, you know, and um, it's just difficult for them to have a conversation and understand how to engage with an adult. And when they go to college, I mean, that's, you know, they're protected by parents in high school, (laughs) but when they go to college, then they have to do things on their own. And, I think that's it, there's a gap there because it becomes challenging for them. Mm-hmm. I see. And before I go on that point, I do want to highlight the couple of words that have come up: this connection, connecting, mm-hmm. and presence. Um, I just I, I talk about those a lot. I talk about presence a lot, um, appreciation, and what's going on, and of other mm-hmm. people, and, and and everything around you. So I really like that because. Um, I ask this just because I've heard you mention um, teen teen angst before, and I wonder if this if this um, lack of awareness is contributing to that angst, Um, and and how can I overcome this? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I I mean, and it's very simple. You know, everything I talk about in the book, it's a very uh, simple how to book, (laughs) and so when you look at all the simple changes that you can make, you know. I think that that's what can help you eliminate that angst. And so building confidence in making eye contact and being comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the biggest things that teens probably are uncomfortable with. Um, You know, knowing how to have a conversation with an adult. Well, if you're not having a conversation, you know, if you're always on a digital device, then how do you know how to have a conversation? Or for that matter, communicate in full sentences. (laughs) Is. Sure, sure. You know, everything is abbreviated nowadays. I see. Right. Um, but I think those are small things. I mean, I do talk about things like, I don't know how to split a bill with your friends when you go out, mm-hmm. um, you know, but I don't think that those are really contributing factors to teenage angst. Yeah. I think the biggest factors are communication, um, you know, being able to look at, if you can look at yourself in the mirror, then you can look at another person in, um, in the eye. And um, I think that also goes to, I I think it's across the board, you know, whether it's eating habits or how you dress, um, you know, there's a persona that you need to dress like someone or be like someone. Mm -hmm. And I really want to remind parents and teens both that, um, you know, just be authentic. You don't need to wear labels. You don't need to promote, why promote someone else's brand? Why not promote? And it's perfectly okay to, you know, wear brands, um, but why not create your own brand and establish, you know, who you are, what your personality is, you know, let that come out and shine because 
that's where the confidence comes from. Mm -hmm. You know, I did want to, next to a question right up here, I do want to ask about personal brands and, and what is a personal brand? And it sounds like I know the answer, but do people, does everybody need one or just people in business? What is a no. personal yeah. I mean, I think everyone needs one, you know, um, regardless of what you're doing, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're working in the corporate world. Um, I think it's just a defining component. It, it's it kind of defines you, your brand. Um, and even if it's in personal relationships and family, you know, it's really about you respecting yourself. It's really about um, because we want our family to respect us. You know, we want people in our personal relationships to respect us. And if we don't have that, if we don't have our confidence, um, then people aren't going to see us that way. People aren't going to come to us for advice or, you know, they may not respect our decisions, um, which leads to maybe a lack of harmony in a relationship. And so maintaining your personal brand and maybe outside of the business world, it's not so much about what you're wearing, but it's how you're bringing yourself to an event, a conversation, you know, how you're showing up to um, a relationship internally and externally, you know, let, let's be honest, this is not just about external, <laughs> you know, how you dress or, you know, um, how you communicate your body language, but this is also about internal as well, is your, your, um, your attitude, your mindfulness, you know, um, how are you feeling and how are you bringing yourself? Yes, okay. Um, how then, uh, what are some personal success, uh, brand, branding success, excuse me, personal branding success myths that people believe about you? Yeah. Um, I think that um, probably following what I just said is a lot of people think that it's just on the outside and not on the inside. Okay, okay then. <laughs> and so, you know, you, people show up wearing a thousand dollar suit and think that, you know, they're, they're selling um, confidently but you don't have the internal components. So, um, you know, you may not have the positive attitude or um, you may not have, have the best attitude. And so I think it's the internal component that's missing in that case. All right, yeah, okay. So you already did disclose the, the big myth in that earlier. I missed it. Um, is a, what about this? Can, can one really dress for success? I mean, I know we say it's not about external, but can you also, can that, I don't know, can you dress for success? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, whether you're wearing jeans or whether you're in a suit or a dress, um, you can absolutely dress for success. Mm -hmm. And the way I would define that is in the details. Um, it doesn't matter what you wear, but, you know, just make sure that you're paying attention to the details. I think that's where it really comes in and matters, regardless of what you're wearing. You know, make sure that you're clean. And I think a cleanliness is a big aspect of that. I talked about this last week, I think on a Facebook live, um, yeah. the cleanliness aspect has also been lost. And, um, you know, that's a big part of the details, you know, making sure your clothes are ironed or steamed or, um, just those are the type of details that I'm referring to. Wow. That's a, it's, it's amazing. I'm laughing because it just seems a little bit odd that you have to Refer, like, oh, wow. like cleanliness, you know, well, you gotta be, you gotta be clean. You gotta be washed when you go and, and meet people as, ah. well, um, yeah, you know what I, on that, um, it's, it's funny thinking of this, just, um, there's a lot of things that occurred to me, like a lot of popular, uh, songs, movies, things, uh, past books that I read. I'm, I'm envious of some of the etiquette and pat and older books that I read had the way people talk to each other and treat themselves and uh, carry themselves. Um, mm -hmm. there's a, in, in this one here, as far as, as your presentation or dressing for success. Now this guy in the, that I'm going to bring up has it, has it half, half and half, but uh, it's an old Chris Christopherson song from the seventies, I think. And it's Sunday morning coming down and the opening lyrics I'll summarize. He, he basically wakes up on a Sunday morning hungover and then he gets up and has beer, a couple beers. And then he looks in his closet, he puts on his cleanest dirty shirt. But then he says, and I shaved my face and combed my hair and stumbled down the stairs to meet the day. And I just find just not that long ago, people thought even a guy who's hung over and drinking, going out, he just can't go outside without shaving, you know? And I thought, where are, where, where do we, where do we come from there? Right. It's amazing to me. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, just a, a final one on the dressing thing. What if someone says to you, isn't dressing, um, isn't dressing well, just a social convention affecting, image in other people's eyes and unrelated to private self-worth? 
because I again bring up that guy. He was he was that about what was that about? Um, you know, it is about self worth. Um, you know, I would say yes. Again, there is an external component, but it's certainly about self worth because let's say for example, wearing your little black dress. Um, it's a very popular term, you know, that everybody refers to wearing your little black dress, but that's what makes you feel, um, very comfortable and confident. So, uh, you know, it's certainly, it's certainly related to, to how you feel internally. Um, I can, you know, I've actually worked with a client recently who couldn't understand why she needed to dress up and how I explained it to her, you know, and how she felt. And, and that was the example that I gave her is, you know, why do you have a favorite outfit? Um, or what is your favorite outfit, you know? And, and that's where the little black dress came up. And she said, oh, it's my little black dress. And I said, why? Uh, well, it makes me feel good. It makes me, you know, no matter what's happened in my day, no matter what is going on, um, I put it on and, you know, I just feel good. And, um, and, and so that's what I'm, those are the things that, you know, I refer to in terms of how it makes you feel good on the inside and why it matters. Now, we can't wear our favorite dress or outfit or suit every day, but if we practice, you know, all the other pieces, then regardless of what you wear, you're going to feel good. Yeah, I, I certainly identify what you're talking about there. I do recognize when I wear different clothes, I feel certainly feel a different way. And I'm sure everybody recognizes on some level uh, that they that they're elevated through uh, what they wear. Um, maybe what maybe some fun, like just specifics. So what are some do's and don'ts in the workplace? <laughs> Where do I begin? <laughs> uh, wherever you like. <laughs> um, in terms of dressing, I okay. will say, I'll give you a quick example. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I worked with this lady and um, I went, actually it was at a Toastmasters meeting okay. that um, I met her and, uh, you know, she's very educated. She had multiple degrees and the thing that struck me was she was there to share her achievements and um, just all the wonderful things that she had accomplished. She had two young children, you know, she had sacrificed her time away from them to accomplish all of these things. But as she was in this meeting presenting herself, she was wearing slippers and she was wearing a kind of weekend dress. Um, the material of her dress attracted so much lint and dust, you know, that material that attracts everything in the air <laughs> to your yeah. clothes. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, to me, it was like she sacrificed so much, but she didn't realize, you know, that it was just one thing that she needed to do. You know, she pay attention to how she dressed, pay attention to how she brought herself to a presentation. This is a presentation and probably 70% of the people in the room were wearing suits. And so having that awareness to know this is how I need to dress when I walk into this type of meeting versus if I'm just going to come in and not see anyone, you know, and so just understanding and preparing for the audience you're going to be in front of right, for the day. Yeah, I think that's just very important because, you know, you may want the next big project or you may want to go in front of a client, um, but more than likely, your leadership's not going to let you do that if you're not coming fully prepared. Right. So, May, it's about the next step then, because I would, I'm, I'm on board for sure, but I, I, can, I can hear someone might say, but wouldn't her achievements just speak for themselves? Why does she have to you know, put on a front or something to, for, for the other, for the audience. It's like, I'm, I've done this and this and this, you're celebrating it. That's it, isn't it? But you're looking ahead. Is that it or? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, like they say, dress for the job you want. Yes, <laughs> um, right. And uh, you know, if you want to, how can you present yourself as a confident person um, when you're dressed in your flip flops? and you need to speak to some company executives, you know, th there's a huge gap there. And so it, it does matter. Okay. And in that case, you know, and in that case, yes, there's that external factor because you do, you need to have the awareness of, you know, understanding your environment. 
All right, great. Yeah, now oh, oh, I can't resist. My students are going to hate me if they hear me say this, but uh, that that it reminds me of that joke. My my boss said you should dress for the job you want and not the job you have, and so I came yeah. the next day dressed as Batman. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks for laughing. There you go. I didn't know how that would go over you know, on that one. Um, what are some bodily habits that betray us and how can we manage them? Um, ooh. ooh. Yeah, but I, I want to, we got to know, right? We got to make, we got to be aware. Maybe I'm unaware and I, I need Very to know, Rita. You got to help me out. <laughs> Very okay. personal topic. Okay. You know, that's funny. Uh, people, people just avoid this topic altogether. Really? No, I need to know, Nita. You got to help me. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think that, you know, and it is a very sensitive topic because, yeah. you know, it's funny people that know me and then they read my book and they're like, Ooh, you talk about all this stuff. Um, because I do say things like, Hey, make sure the sink is clean when you walk out of the bathroom. I don't care whose bathroom it is, you know, whether it's yours or someone else's or some public place, sure. um, flush the toilet. You know, and it's like you have to, I felt the need to say those things because those things matter. You know, they make up those. These are, again, the micro actions that happen behind the scenes that nobody else sees, um, but they make up who you are. And it makes you it makes you care. You know, if you don't do any of those things, you don't care, which means you're not going to feel good about yourself. Um, but yeah, I have to address, I call it, I have to address the raw to reach refined. And if you don't address the raw, then, um, you cannot be refined. All right. Great. Well, I like the idea it's micro actions. And I guess it's a, it's about get, get into the book and see more of that, but I, I got a good taste of it and it, it, I'm very interested to know more. It, yeah, I mean, I was just going to say, I, I'm not trying to avoid the topic. No, <laughs> it, no. goes from, it goes from everything, you know, from coughing and sneezing and just how you manage yourself, you know, bodily, your bodily functions, you know, people lick their fingers when they're eating or, um, you know, there's just so many nuances that you don't understand biting your nails uh, that you may not pay attention to because that's just what you're doing. Maybe it's a nervous habit. Maybe you're just not aware that this is not something you should be doing in public. It's really just every little thing that I do go through. I do spell out to say, don't do this. Yeah. You know what? It is very useful because I think it is, it's a lot about awareness. People just are not necessarily aware and it's not that mm -hmm. they're trying to be, you know, uh, they don't care about themselves, but they're just sure. not paying attention. If they're made aware, maybe they'll make these adjustments and feel better about themselves and, and, and certainly have more success in the, in the world because of how they come off. So, yeah. So yeah. Well I mean, worth it. yeah, I think nail biting is, you know, a great example because people do that and they don't realize that someone else looking at them is seeing that they're very nervous or uncomfortable um, and it goes into, you know, different body language poses as well, but people can tell when you're uncomfortable and, um, okay. that's not how you want to come across. Certainly not. Yeah. I mean, cause it's are you, the other person I think, is it, am I making them uncomfortable? Is there something wrong with me? Right. Right. Uh, and, or just, is this person just not comfortable and confident? Um, sure, how about, sure. how about some 21st century restaurant, uh, rules? Can you give us a bit of that little taste? Just a, some fun taste of this stuff. Don't face time. <laughs> Okay. There it is. And don't FaceTime. Do not FaceTime at a restaurant. Yeah. If you if you need to, then um, make sure you have some earbuds on. That's right. Um, you know, I, I would say again, just back to the basics, you know, um, keeping your cell phone to a minimum, engaging, um, knowing how to and I think some of these things do go into maybe a more traditional etiquette concept, but knowing how to split the bill or if someone made the situation awkward, you know, you may be out with a group of people and one person says, oh, no, I want to just pay for my own. You know, there's that awkward silence behind that. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you have this harmonious conversation and flow and all of, you know, people are looking at each other like, oh, what do we do now? Yeah. Um, but just learning to just keep moving, you know, um, don't let those type of things or people in your environment disrupt the flow. Because um, again, all of this is about um, feeling, feeling happy, feeling confident, you know, your self-esteem. It's all about feeling good and having a good experience every day, not just occasionally. 
I love it, Nia. This is what we're all about here. Just, you know, living better, feeling good most of the time, as, as, as much as you can, feeling confident. Uh, how about travel tips then? What about travel tips in terms of manners? Because this is, people uh, are traveling these days way more. I mean, all my young kids, like the students that I have and, and older, you know, university ones, they just all been all over the place. Right? So everybody's traveling now. What is going on with the- Absolutely, like, absolutely. And I think, you know, for the travel piece, it's more of how do you make a smoother um, travel, how do you have a smoother traveling uh, experience yeah. um, rather than maybe etiquette. There's certainly etiquette um, involved because I can tell you I've been in line to get on the plane and, um, you know, I've seen people comb their hair or <laughs> just do absurd things as they're about to step onto the plane. I've seen people drop their cell phone through the little, you know, gap between <laughs> Um, the gate and the um, the plane, oh, no. and so you know they're more mindful things, not so much etiquette. Yep. Uh, just hold on to your cell phone for a second while you <laughs> actually step onto the plane, you know, or put it away. Um, otherwise, you're about to travel someplace, and you know you're ruining your whole experience. Um, right. I think yeah, the presence. Thing, right. Enjoy what's going presence. on. Presence. Yeah. Yeah. Don't brush your hair. Oh my gosh. Uh, another huge one that I have okay. actually seen all over Twitter. I have seen, um, I can't, I believe it was a couple of months ago where this post blew up because somebody was clipping their nails on the flight. Clipping their nails. Yes. <laughs> on the flight. Wow. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, again, the lost common sense. Right? <laughs> that's Well, that's what I wonder. I mean, we got our theory of the digital age bringing us somewhere. I guess, is it just, we're just so, because we're digital, we're just unaware of people around us to that extent, or is there something else going on bringing us to clipping nails on the plane? I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. I would say the other aspect of, you know, travel trips, uh, travel tips yep. is more about, I think a lot of people in living in a high stress world now, you know, there's a lot of anxiety in travel and just knowing how to feel calm, knowing how to be prepared for a long or short flight, or if the person next to you starts panicking, you know, how do you help them? Um, so there's there's a lot of things that I talk about, but I would say, you know, just, just be prepared. Make sure you have reading material. Make sure you have something that is entertaining to you. Not just one thing, but maybe three things, you know, whether it's a movie on your iPad or it's a book or... Uh, music that'll calm you down, but just make sure that you have multiple things that can occupy your time. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite things that I have started doing for the past year now mm -hmm. is um, I wear a mask when I get on the plane, uh, just because there are all kinds of smells okay. <laughs> on the plane. Yeah. And um, I'll put a dab of lavender oil in my mask. Mm. It's very relaxing. You know, if you want to take a nap, especially if you decide, hey, I'm going to rest on this flight, uh, that little dab of lavender just puts you right out. Um, it's very calming. And um, if you have anxiety when you travel, I think that's a great tip for that as well, is mm -hmm. whatever your favorite essential oil is, you know, just put it on put it on your mask. These days, everybody wears masks. And mm -hmm. so, you know, put a little dab of oil in your mask. And, um, you know, it's just a relaxing way of kind of having a trip. Sounds great. I haven't certainly haven't heard that. And it sounds like in, in all those other things you're talking about throughout everything so far, there's lots of gold in your book. I want to get to your book in just a second, but just a couple more on, on this one. I really like to get to you. Um, one, I wonder about social media in general, like being on social media, not using it in public, but I mean, on social media, do you have anything on etiquette in terms of that? Or is that something you've um, don't focus on too much? I don't focus on it too much. You know, the only thing that I want to say about social media is, just make sure what you're posting. I think what's happened is people have become far too comfortable to post anything and everything. Yeah. And, um, you know, I told a friend the other day uh, who posted something and I said, your dad is on social media or your uncle is on social media. Would you want him to see this? And she mm -hmm. was like, oh, I never thought about that. <laughs> right. um, you know, so while people are sharing more and more and while people are becoming more transparent about their lives, there is certainly a line to draw what you don't post. And right. I think having that awareness of 
what you should and shouldn't post. And I don't want to say, you know, what you should and shouldn't post, but I think that's, again, what is appropriate in that moment, you know, you already know the answer, (laughs) whether you do it or not is a different story. You already know the answer. Yeah, that's it. I wouldn't say we'd be you or I would be dictating. Here's what you should post, but it's about asking that question. Right. If you're thinking about who's out there, your aunt, your uncle, right. or whatever, you right. know the answer now. So I, right. I really like that. Yeah, um, it, it's also I guess part of your personal brand. I mean, that's a whole history of what you've done, and people can find out. And here's what I'm. Here's what I'm about. Here's what I show. Here's what I put out. Yeah, so yeah. Because so what do you, you want to show? Exactly, exactly. Because yeah, absolutely. That says everything about your brand and. Um, nowadays, employers, you know, they look at your social media. They don't just look at LinkedIn as a professional network, but they'll look at your Facebook or Instagram. Um, and if there's something that's inappropriate, then that is going to impact their decision. So, yeah, it does matter. Big time. All right. Uh, let me give you this last one here on a little more related to your background. Uh, what were some of the communication and etiquette differences between the two cities? of your upbringing and even how did your Indian heritage play into those, uh, that concept, your, your full conception of, of etiquette, all of that mix. And you thought, Hey, here's how I ought to be. I mean, Um, (laughs) yeah, I knew you hinted at some at the beginning, but maybe some more, what was totally different. You said about just, you recognize it was different. You know, even people don't have to sit straight here, but we did here. And is there anything else, um, you can, you know, I would say there were a lot of life skills taught when I was going to school in London. Um, things like ballroom dancing, uh, swimming, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, basic self care, all of those things were very mandatory. And that was, you know, maybe as a seven year old, mm-hmm. you needed to know how to stitch something up if you're dressed for, um, yeah. you know, and, and when is a seven year old going to go ballroom dancing? You know, <laughs> but it was a mandatory skill. It was just something that was a part of life that you learned. Mm-hmm. And um, I would say those are some of the big life skills in general in England were different than life skills, you know, here in the States. Um, it, it was just much more relaxed, I would say. What you wear didn't matter how you sat, didn't matter. Um, you could pretty much act up and get away with it, you know. So it was much harder for a teacher to discipline a class of students. Uh, because there was that, that lack of discipline. And I'm not saying one way is better versus the other, but mm-hmm. that was just my upbringing and my experience and, um, you know, kind of how I my, form my perspective in wanting to share this information. All right. Yeah, maybe maybe just, uh, as we said, getting we're getting more relaxed these days. Maybe it hit the States and or North America earlier than it hit Europe, uh, that, that relaxed state, and then, you know, that's where we came. I want to ask you about Boss Vibes, Uh, the book Boss Vibes, Self-Esteem, Success, and the Art of Etiquette. What are Boss Vibes? (laughs) Boss Vibes are, (laughs) uh, the word really conveys confidence. um, That's what I felt. (laughs) That's good. It it comes out like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, feeling like you're in charge of yourself. It's not really that you're bossing others, but you're the boss of yourself. You know, and how do you want to be? How do you want to present yourself? How do you want to convey yourself? And so that's, yeah, that's where the term boss vibes came from. I thought it was a little fun and and different um, in terms of what it conveyed. It certainly is. And, and as I mentioned, it is it is kind of what I got from it. What you just said there is like, that's how I felt it anyway. So you've done well selecting it. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Why, so I get a hint of why you wrote it. You kind of said why you even care about etiquette, etiquette at all. Um, so why did you write it? And who is it for, I guess? I, I think we kind of know from what we said so far, but can you give me more on this book? Why the book? Uh, so somewhere along my corporate journey, you know, I was in a position where I interviewed and hired hundreds of people. And that is where I came to realize the gap between people, how they were presenting themselves and how they were kind of missing that two degree shift um, of how they should be presenting themselves. You know, they were very excited about wanting a job, but they didn't understand why they didn't get it. And, um, you know, a lot of it, some of it was external, some of it was internal, you know, the the attitude that they would show up with. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so I, after talking to just so many people, I really felt compelled to fill that gap. And, and, um, also as an HR manager at the time, 
it was difficult to say certain things to your employees. Um, things like, hey, you might want to shower before you come to work. <laughs> you know, just very simple things like we talked about earlier. Yeah. And, um, you, you know, there would be people who are expecting promotions or they're expecting to, like I said, be in front of a client or get a big project, but they were not showing up in the right way, whether it was external or internally, their attitude or their mindset. And so that's where I felt the need to um, share the information because to me, it was like, you know, I want to help more than just the people that were on my team. I wanted to really share this message with the world and as a reminder, say, hey, <laughs> yeah. you know, here's why you need to practice common manners. It's going to help you professionally, but it's also going to help you personally in so right. many ways. Yeah, very worthy project for, uh, for sure. Now, what if someone uh, thinks that they know everything about etiquette? What, what do you still think they're missing that they can find in your book? I know what I, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Uh, (laughs) yeah, yeah, that, that's a lot of people. Um, you know, I would say it's kind of like breathing. Everybody knows that everybody breathes and everybody knows that when you take a deep breath, how it makes you feel more relaxed. I think this book is in the same way. It's a reminder because we all know what we should be doing, but when someone uh, reminds us as to why it's important, I think it makes us want to put it into practice. And so, that's exactly what the book is about. It's, it's just a reminder to say, hey, here's what you need to do, but here's why it's important to do it as well. Mm, wow, that's amazing because I, I think of that of this show as that sometimes I say for, you know, sometimes I'm not, I've done even some solo shows where I just share a perspective of my own and something mm-hmm. that I think here's something we, you ought to think about. Um, but it's not necessarily that I'm coming with some new information. I, I actually refer to the show as a reset or a refocus, just kind of give your head a shake and say, oh yeah, I have to be paying attention to these things. So, I mean, I, I'm sure you've got a lot of new insight, but I, you say it's more of like a, a reset and I hear that uh, big time. Yeah, I think the why behind it is important. You know, we, I'll go back to the breathing, you know, (laughs) we're breathing all day, but when someone says, hey, you know, take a deep breath and you take that deep breath and you're like, oh yeah, this makes me feel relaxed. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, I think that's what it is. It's the why. It's uh, sharing and helping them understand that this is making you feel better. You know, this is making me feel better if I act this way, if I conduct myself in this way. Okay. A final one on etiquette. I would want to ask you about your, your artwork if we have a bit of time, but final one on etiquette. Okay. Uh, does adopting modern etiquette mean bowing to social convention and not being oneself? And how can someone adopt your tips and stay true to their authentic self? I'm hearing it all through, uh, but give us the summary. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that you can still maintain your authenticity and follow modern etiquette. And that's why I want to call it modern etiquette. That's why it's not traditional etiquette, because I think in traditional etiquette, you are getting lost in the protocols of society versus with how I explain modern etiquette. It's very much about you. Um, You know, we're not saying how you need to dress, just make sure that you're polished off when you walk out the door. And so that's how you're staying able to stay authentic to yourself. Right. I like that idea. It's not about telling you, we said it earlier, but it's not about telling you how to dress, but it's about asking yourself, how do I really want to, who do I think I am and who do I want to be? And what am I going to, how am I going to present that? Yeah. That's really uh, powerful to me. Um, I want to ask you about your artwork. Yeah, um, absolutely. How did you get drawn to art? It was actually just a creative outlet that I fell into and, um, you know, after a while I started collecting a lot of pieces and uh, I did one show and I hesitantly did one show and that was really it. Yeah. I think after that I was, I was hooked and um, I said, you know, I'm going to continue this. All right. That show was Opa Lessons. Is that right? Um, Opa Lessons or- was the show that I did this year. Um, oh, sorry. So you said originally you did a show and then originally hooked, and then. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. Latest is- I mean, originally when I started in the art space, you know, I would just create work and it was just for my own, uh, like I said, creative outlet and it would just pile up and I wasn't going to do anything with it. I had no plans whatsoever, but um, I ended up doing my first show and uh, that kind of hooked me on to, you know, this is really fun. (laughs) 
I think I want to share my work with the world. And so I, uh, yeah, <laughs> that was the beginning. What, what is your art about? Um, you know, it's certainly changed over time, but I would say I started with mixed media work. And so just lots of different material, lots of different, um, I would use a lot of wood and glass and um, those type of materials. Over time, I got into large format abstract artwork. Um, it's just something that I just love creating. And I think now, first it was, um, I started it originally because it was healing me. And now, you know, I create it because I want to share that healing energy with um, others. And so a lot of it is based on color therapy. It's all energetic artwork, um, of course, but, you know, just based on color therapy and how, you know, the colors make you feel, what they represent. Um, I also use a lot of gemstones in my artwork nowadays. So um, I think that the energy that the stones give off add to the artwork itself. Um, yeah, and, and I maybe I understand you, you're drawn to opals uh, in particular. What, what drew you to them? You know, I think it was a representation of how they give you that sense of inhibition. Mm -hmm. I, I think that that was what drew me to the opals and that's why my series for this year was called Opalescence. Yep. Um, and I named every piece after a different opal, you know, red opal, fire opal. Um, everything was based on the different types of opals. Uh, I, I just think that the energy that the stone gives off and the dimensions and the layers of the stone was just very representational of life to me. All right. And you mean inhibition, is that, I'm trying here, but is inhibition, is that more like taking a moment to check yourself, uh, see how, you know, ask those questions, how my awareness, is that what you mean by inhibition or not? Yeah. And maybe it ties more to authenticity as well. Okay. You know, I think that we get caught up in following um, whatever society deems as success. <laughs> and uh, there's just so many things that we can do that are more authentic to help us reset and understand who we are. And so, um, yeah, that, that's, that's what I mean by uninhibited, is understanding who you are and what you're really looking for, what your purpose is. All right. Well, th this question then might be what you've just said, but I wonder if, if there's more. Is there a connection to your professional life, your um, and, and your artistic life, and obviously your professional artist? But I mean, in your psychology consultative practices, what is the connection to your art there, or is it just more? It's therapy for me and for other people, and then I refresh and come back to the world. I mean. You know, I would describe it as a more left brain, right brain activity. I think okay. there's a balance there. And um, people think that you have to, that people are only left brained or they're only right brained. And I think that there's, everything is about balance in life. And so the technical side of my work is, you know, allows me to use my left brain and the artistic side allows me to use my right brain. And so I think it's just about balance. Excellent. Yeah. It's all about, it's all about what's good for you and in, in enjoying a great life. Um, final one on this. Are there rules of etiquette in the art world? Oh my gosh. So many. Okay. <laughs> give, us a, give us a taste. <laughs> Probably at another level than what the book describes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, I think that there's, the reason I say that is I would say, you know, there's just that level of sophistication, especially in the fine art world. Mm -hmm. um, awareness is everything, mm -hmm. whether you're at a gallery opening or whether you're interacting with clients in the fine art space. I mean, awareness, 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 that that's everything. Um, but, you know, there are some more traditional etiquette factors in the fine art world. And so, um, yeah, I think that there's a there's a blend of that. <laughs> okay, well that's excellent. I mean, Nita, I've gotten all kinds out of you here. Um, it's really uh, fun and fascinating, and I'm sure I can get more. Um, I'm really interested to read the book now. Um, I wonder if there's anything that I uh, I didn't ask you that you wish I had, or something else you'd like to kind of say uh, in summary, or. Um, you know, the only thing that I'll add to uh, our conversation is one of my favorite topics is body language. I think that we underestimate the power of how, what our body language means and how it makes us feel. And I talk about it quite a bit in, in the book. Um, 
but that would be one thing that I want to point out is, you know, how you sit, how you stand, um, poses that make you feel good. You know, I talk about a lot of those things in the book and, um, I just think, I just want to do, you know, call that out because again, going back to things that we've forgotten or we know that, you know, like a victory pose, we know that the fist pump is celebration, but we don't know that it actually changes the physiology of your body. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's one of my favorite topics that I love to talk about. (laughs) Well, I mean, do you want to give just a a minute on that? Um, anything else that you'd love to share with us maybe to, I don't know, give us a little more on, on, um, I can share, yeah, yeah, I can share a booster tip. (laughs) Yeah, sure. Yeah. Something. Cause I, I think I almost meant that when I was bringing up the bodily thing and then we went to bodily functions, but I think I meant more just your body (laughs) betray you, your posture, et cetera, as well. I mean, but I, yeah. yeah I so the only, uh, so I'll share a body, uh, I'll share a confidence pose yeah, great. and, um, you know, it's a, it's a cliche pose. It's where you see the, uh, it's the cliche madman pose, um, where, you know, the man is, has his legs crossed on the desk and his arms behind his head kind of leaned back. Yep. Um, but believe it or not, that pose, when you sit in that pose for two minutes, you actually raise your testosterone levels and your cortisol levels drop. Mm-hmm. So when you're feeling nervous about walking into a meeting or you know, you're about to have a difficult conversation, that pose will give you confidence and um, you know, you'll actually feel calmer and, and better before you walk into that conversation. So um, that's a fun pose that, you know, I think it's, it's such a cliche pose yep. <laughs> that I like to bring it up um, because again, like I said, it changes the physiology of your body. You know, it changes your hormones, which uh, I think is pretty significant. Very significant. I'm all, I'm getting more and more learning loads about hormones these days in, in mostly in relation to physical health and diet, but also in how we feel. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, That's, that's quite amazing. And, and, you know, cliches, they come, they come from, because there's something real in them. That's why they're sure. become cliches. Um, sure. and, I've, and of course, we we'll just make sure you don't mean once you're in the meeting, you're not doing that to like, oh my God, I got to calm myself down. And no, uh, no, do not do that in the middle of Calm yourself, <laughs> get your cortisol down and go in feeling great. I, I love the, the sound of all that. Um, all right, Nita. Well, I'm going to ask you where listeners can find you in, in just a sec. I just want to uh, mention to listeners uh, to please share this interview. Um, you can see how much uh, how much how much fun it is and how much value there is in it. Um, you've enjoyed yourself, and uh, why don't you share it with one or two people you know uh, need to hear this and or would would otherwise enjoy it um, as well. You might have questions. You heard along w- uh, what I was talking about. Um, you say, "Hey, Bolton, you didn't ask this. What's wrong with you?" I, you know, well, why don't you ask it? You can ask a question in the comment section, um, wherever you consume. Uh, you can also go to the Mr. Brightside Facebook page, facebook.com slash matthewbolton.ca. Ask a question there and I'll make sure Nita gets it if uh, it's something directed at her. And usually is nobody's asking me anything, Nita. All right. So, um, Nita, where should people go if they want to bypass that avenue and contact you directly, uh, connect with you, learn about you and your work? Um, so I would say the best place is on my website. It's nita-patel.com. That's N-I-T-A-P-A-T-E-L.com. Yep. And I'm on social media everywhere, but I would say my website is the best place to get in touch with me. Get to the website. All right. Well, that's simple. I love it. Um, I'll just uh, thank you very much, Nita, for coming on. I really enjoyed myself. Uh, this topic is something uh, really I thought right away when I saw it, it was about the awareness for me. We need to be aware. We got to think about this. And then also uh, with an expert hand to guide us and how to think about it. So I really appreciate it coming on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This is wonderful. I appreciate uh, you allowing me to share my message. Yeah, great. Um, and to everybody else, Elevate your own self-image and improve the world around you by discovering the meaning behind the manners and by adopting and practicing proper etiquette in your own life for you. And I'll see you guys next time. You you heard me. I said I was a Canadian. I have to ask. You're in Dallas. I do care about hockey even a little bit with the stars. You know what? I used to. Uh, This is probably going to date me a little bit, but I used to be a Mike Madonna fan. Oh, yeah. (laughs) He played for the stars. And then he retired and it was over. Yeah, yeah. In my, uh, you know, my younger enjoying the aggression mode. uh, I really enjoyed it. In fact, I made my son who was four at the time. I made him play hockey. (laughs) 
You're going to be like Madano. You got to go f- smooth and fly in there. I need your jersey blowing in the wind. Be cool. Mr. Brightside, your time out to refresh, refuel, and refocus your mind and energy toward building an optimistic framework for flourishing. Life is good. It's up to you to choose the bright side. 